bow your heads with me one more time. I have to do my normal prayer. Father in heaven, it's that time. It's your time, it's your day, it's your message, it's your people, it's your word. I am a humble, broken tool in your belt, Lord. Happy to be used by you. And Father, I ask that you use me as you see fit this morning. Talk when it's time, quiet when it's time, sit when it's time. And let everything that happens be from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The bulletin says unity. That's what I was supposed to speak about. But I wasn't feeling it. And I don't always go with my feelings, but I do use them when I speak. And so today I'm going to go with something that um, is closer to the heart. And it's a story we all know. It's a situation we all know, but I think it's something that we need to be reminded of because of the times that we're living in right now. Because exactly what he was praying about right now. Because of what we go through during the week. Because of what we face day in and day out. So let's go to the story of Peter walking on water. Let's talk about it this morning. It's an oldie but goodie. Everyone should know it. If you don't know it, we're going to go through it quickly today. But there's some things that I saw these last couple of weeks in that story that I hadn't seen before. There's some situations that came up because of life that I hadn't understood before. So I want to share those with you today and tell you a couple of stories of my experiences in the last couple of months. And some of the things that Jesus has taught me in the last couple of months. Some very humbling things. And see if we can all tie this together. So please... If you want some scriptural references, we're going to open up to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 36. 22 through 36. And then the story is also picked up in Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 56. And in John 6, 16 through 24. Those three chapters tell the story of the disciples out on the, on the, on the, on the sea. The only one that tells about Peter walking on water is in Mark, so that's going to be the basis. But the other two Gospels tell a little bit extra of the story. So let's go through it a little bit. All the Gospels record the story, but it's only Matthew that talks about Peter walking on water. So let's take a look at the story and find out what Jesus was doing and what Jesus did. When we open up the story, we find Jesus preaching and teaching, as he always did. And we find him feeding. This is the story of him feeding the 5,000. Now... If you notice, um, or if you have done any, taken a look into this at all, only 5,000 men are recorded in the Bible because they only took census of the men. So most scholars estimate that it was between 10 and 20,000 people that Jesus fed, not just 5,000, because you had women and children also there and, and relatives, and, and it makes the miracle that much greater when you consider it was just two fish and five loaves of bread. All of a sudden, Jesus praying over this food from this young man and breaking it and it continuing to break over and over. 5,000 was miracle enough. Shoot, my, my family of five would be miracle enough, right? But when you take a look and it becomes 5,000 and then you say, okay, but there were men and women and children there and it could be ten to 20,000. All of a sudden your mind gets exploded because how much food was actually there? And then to have all the baskets left over. How much food was made from the prayer? Jesus, what? Wow. And you become enthralled by what he did. It makes me want to learn how to pray like he prayed. It makes me want to learn how to believe like he believes. It makes me want to understand what it is because there are lots of things I would like to break five, ten thousand, twenty thousand times like dollar bills or like, you know, my bills, actual bills in the little bitty pieces and throw them away. I would love to do that. Tell God, no, I need, I need this to be broken in 20,000 little pieces and disappear. Or I need this to grow into 20,000 bigger pieces. I would love that, but it's all about following God's will. And Jesus was constantly in the will of his father. And so we find him in this story and the Bible says right away, Verse Matthew 14, verse 22, it says, Right away Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. They had gone on, they had fed everybody, and said right away he made them get into the boat. He had them go on ahead of him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. 
Then he sent the crowd away. So he has fed them. He has overfed them. The disciples handed out enough bread and fish to feed everyone into the crowd so they were full. And there were 12 baskets of food left over. And then in Luke 19, it says, or Luke 9, it says, the disciples were part of this miracle, and yet the Bible says they didn't fully understand it. The Bible says their hearts were hard or stubborn. They knew Jesus was special. They knew he was different. They knew there was something unique about him. But they did not realize yet that he was the Messiah. He was the Savior. He was God in a human body. They were not seen with kingdom eyes. So Jesus was about to do another miracle, and this time the disciples would fully realize who he was. Jesus had performed miracle after miracle in front of them. Now he needed to perform a miracle for them. And they needed to see. The miracle wasn't the walking on the water. The miracle was them to see who he really was. Sometimes we go through this life and we don't understand why we go through what we go through. Why we deal with what we deal with. God, why am I in this situation? God, why has this happened? Why have you allowed this? He says, son, I'm trying to open your eyes so you can see. You're still focused on the wrong thing. You're still focused on what's happening. I need you to focus and open your eyes so you can see. Could someone please check? Okay, all right. Early in the morning. Oh, let's go, let's go back a little bit. The disciples went out to the Sea of Galilee, then he sent the crowd away, and after he had sent them away, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. And Jesus often sneaked away from other people to spend time alone with his heavenly father or with his dad. And when evening came, he was there alone, and the boat was already a long way away from land. It was being pounded by the waves because the wind was blowing against it. It says, early in the morning, Jesus went out to the disciples. He walked on the lake. They saw him on the lake and were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But right away, Jesus called out to them and said, be brave, it is I. Don't be afraid. I love the concept of just that peace right there. So let's take a look at it because I have to animate it for me to understand it, right? Everybody's fed and everybody's full. The crowd is pressing in. They want more, more, more. Jesus tells his disciples, get in the boat and head to the other side. Now, they've taken the boat. He sends them away. He sends the crowd away. And then he walks off to the mountainside by himself. He goes to be alone and pray. He goes to go be alone and talk with God. First off, greatest lesson right there. Sometimes you just need some alone time to talk with God. In this day and age and in this society and my generation, we love to spend our alone time on the phone looking at other people's lives. Bottom line, I have, I'm going to talk about nobody, but I, 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 it's funny to me to see Facebook updates from the pews in church. I'm not talking about nobody, but we've seen it, right? Did you update your status from church? You got to let everybody know, I made it to church today. Woohoo! You're supposed to be here talking to him. We can't even come to his house and spend time with him. I know we're not spending alone time with him. Okay? There's a problem there. Because there are times when you need to talk to God, but 99% of the time, he needs to talk to you. Because what you have to say is not nearly as vital as what he has. Not nearly as vital. See, here's the funny thing about God, and, and Dad and I have been going through this for the last two weeks because we pray, for lack of a better term, that's my girlfriend right there, okay? We pray constantly, okay? We are always on the phone talking, sharing, praying together. We have bonded because of prayer. We pray together openly, honestly. I have a man who I can cry in front of in prayer, and he doesn't treat me any different. For men, do you know how important that is? I have a man who I can look at and say, I'm weak, and he doesn't treat me any different. Do you understand how important that is? A lot of us men, first of all, would not admit that we're weak and can't handle it, but we would not have that ability to cry and pray in front of someone. And it started 
What a fishing trip we were doing for the, for the boys. Teaching guys how to fish. He came, we, we talked, we prayed, and all of a sudden it was just somebody that I could pray with. There's a bond through prayer. <clears throat> Dan and I understand the concept of waiting and listening on God for what he has to say. Because there's a secret that we don't understand. There's a, there's a concept that we don't get. So I'm going to share it with you before we move on in the story. I was given a book. And at the, I was told to read the last chapter of this book. The book is called Love Like You've Never Been Hurt. I was told, read the last chapter, you'll like it. And the last chapter tells a story about a chess piece. There's a, there's a painter who painted a chess piece. And in that chess piece, uh, uh, that painting, it's a picture of a child playing chess against the devil. And the devil is has him cornered and boxed in. I think it's called uh, checkmate. The piece is called checkmate. The devil has his, his king cornered and boxed in. And it's a famous piece, and it was up in a guy's house, and a famous chess player comes to visit this wealthy man, and they're eating together, and he looks up at the, the painting, and he says, I think I can help that kid. And the, the, the owner of the painting goes, no, that's checkmate. He's done. And he looks at it again, and he says, no, I think I can help that kid. Can you get a chessboard and set it up? So they get out a chess board and they set it up just like it is in a painting. And the chess player walks around it, looks at it, he takes the king, makes a move, and he's out of checkmate. And everybody sat there dumbfounded. Wait, wait, what you, wait a minute. No. Whoa. And the point of it was, the king, your father, always has another move. Always has another move. You never get to checkmate God. And here's why. Because God, I got to tell the other story. Can I tell the other story? Can I, I don't even want to use it. Can I use it? Okay, all right. There's a young, I don't want to call him an idiot savant because he's not, but he's got a brilliant mind. He's a young man who can play nine chess games at once, blindfolded. He remembers every move, every piece. He can record the last 20 years world chess tournament, the final game, you can set up a board from any one of the games. And he can look at the board and tell you what two players and finish the game for both sides. His brain is brilliant. He's brilliant. And he sits there able to play nine games at a time blindfolded and we think that's great. My God, your God is playing chess on games that haven't even happened yet and he's already won the game. That's who that we serve. That's the God that we're dealing with. The game hasn't even started. He's already checkmated the enemy and won. And we fret because it looks tough. We fret because we get boxed in. We wonder, God, why has this happened to me? No, how about, son, you trust me and follow me? I've got the game already won. I told you in the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, devil, you've taken my kids. I'm going to kill you. Don't you understand where this is going? I checkmated him in Genesis. Just because we haven't reached Revelation yet doesn't mean the game's not already won. And yet we fret. We fear, which doesn't come from God. We fail in our faith. We fold before the game has actually been played out. We sit there and go through the process over and over again when God is just sitting back, my child, just trust me. You asked me for this and I got it. Just trust me. What have I promised you? Just trust me. Dan sent me something this week on Facebook that blew our minds. I got to use it again. I have to clear it with him because he preaches too. We, we don't want to use the same things. There was a preacher who was talking. And he was talking about, him. he was doing something, and his child came to him and said, Daddy, for my next birthday, can you take me to Disney World? And he was not paying attention and just said, yeah, 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 yeah. Not paying attention. 
he was a little worried because he's now looking at tickets to go to Walt Disney World because his daughter was going, had gone around and told all her friends, next birthday my daddy's taking me to Walt Disney World. And then she had gone around, when they went to the mall, there's a Disney store, and she said, Daddy, that's the dress I'm going to wear when I go to Walt Disney World. And she is telling all her family, all her friends, and every day she's looking forward to this trip that Daddy promised, because all she understands is my dad promised it, it's going to happen. That's all she understands. She has no concept of airfare, no concept of hotel costs. No concept of daddy trying to get vacation time for this. No concept of daddy doesn't make enough money to take the whole family to Walt Disney World. No concept of how much time he needs to raise the money to take the family to Walt Disney World. She has no concept of that. All she understands is my daddy said it's going to happen, so it's going to happen. Because he's kept his promises before, he's going to keep them now. That's all she understands. And she's going around professing that it's going to happen before it's actually happened. Lessons you can learn from a child. Lessons you can learn from a child. What has your father promised you that's going to happen? What has your father told you that will be done? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you will be also. I came upon a new promise this week. Okay? The promise was, is, was, the promise is, if you believe in me, I will save you, you and your household. That's what it says, right? The, okay, so God, you mean my kids and my wife. Okay, um, there was a time when my sister lived with me and she counted my household. Okay, my mama, um, 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 all my niece and nephews, um, um, yes. I said you and your household, but God, what about free will? What did I say? Do you believe in me? You let me handle what I gave you, free will. You let me handle that. I said, if you believe in me, I'll save you and your household. Wow. So I need to walk around professing, stay with you, believe in you, focus on you, and just know that when I get to those gates in heaven, I will walk into that first Sabbath with my family in tow and intact. Is that what you're telling me, God? Is that? And, and I just see God looking at me sometimes going, what did I promise? Have I ever lied? Tells me what kind of parent I need to be. Because I promised my son Disneyland next year too. Tells me what kind of parent I need to be. Back to the story. <coughs> Jesus sends his friends across the lake in the storm and in the winds. And in the books of Mark and John, as well as Matthew, they tell the story. But John tells us that the boat, in the book of John, it tells us that the boat was over three miles from the shore by the time, uh, by this time, by nighttime. Mark tells us that we could that Jesus could see the disciples from where he was standing on the mountainside praying. And the disciples were having a hard time rowing because the wind was blowing against them. And since the disciples had taken the boat, there was just one way for Jesus to get across. He didn't swim. He walked on that water. And sometimes we sit here and look at the story. Thank you for this, by the way. Sometimes we sit here and look at the story and we, we see pictures and great paintings and the waves are just rolling like the nice waves on the beach. Who's afraid of waves like that? I've been out in those waves and sharks have been in the water. I, I, I swam quickly away, but sharks were in the water and those waves, no, don't scare me. What kind of waves were these that scared fishermen? This was their job. They were fishermen. What kind of storm was this that you had these men rowing and they couldn't get any further than where they were? What kind of storm was this that they were afraid? What kind of waves was Jesus walking on? Because we look, we see, we have this image in our head of this nice calm storm, this nice summer breeze, this nice, well, what do we have this morning? What would you call that? A, a, a shower? 
We have this idea that the storm was gentle. No, these storm, this storm that they were in was something to behold. And it was designed to take them out. And Jesus sent them into it. You think he didn't know a storm was coming? He sent them straight away, go to the other side. I need you to leave now because you're going to hit the storm. We don't like to think about that. Jesus, you sent me into this mess. But I can tell you in this new role that I have as an associate, I'm not going to say the P word yet, as an associate, already I've been sent into some storms. Already I've had to make phone calls because this is beyond me. Already I've been on my knees because this situation is beyond me. This is more than I can roll through on my own. And Jesus sent them into the storm. How often, like kids at school, do we complain because somebody's trying to make us better? Because it hurts. I was at the gym. I saw a guy I went to school with, Grand Canyon University. I was, I was there about six o'clock in the morning, working out, I left. And I'm passing by and the guy says, hey, Eddie, how are you? And I turned and looked. I know the face, but I don't know the name. I haven't seen this guy in probably 14, 15 years. He remembered me. So we stopped and talked for a while. And he was like, he looked at me and he could tell that I didn't know his name. He said, it's, it's Brad. I said, yeah, yeah, that's who it is, Brad. I knew it was something close. I, I fibbed a little. I knew it was something close. And the lady that he was working out, that he was training, was trying to get out of her training. And she said, I said, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut your training short. She says, no, you can have my next three sessions if you want to. This is hard. She was trying to get out of the trainer she was paying to make her better. How often do we do that? We complain and we fuss and we whine about the very situation God is sending us into to help us progress and make us better. To shake us out of the stagnation of where we are. He sent his disciples into the storm because they needed to open their eyes and see. Let's not forget it was just a few weeks before they were in another storm with Jesus in the boat. He came out and said, peace be still. They were marveled. Who is this man that even nature listens to him? He controls the wind and the seas, but they still couldn't tell who he was. How many times have we sat in these pews and God has revealed who he, is, who he is over and over in our lives, but we still are in the same place. We still are stagnant. We still are not moving. We still are not functioning in the purpose that he designed each and every one of us for because we still don't believe who he is. I was feeling and dealing with the situation a couple weeks ago and I was driving north going for a drive so I could think and panic overcame me I'm not one that's used to panic I'm not one that's used to fretting I'm not one who's used to fear and it overcame me and I had to pull off the road and I said, God, what is going on with me? And he talked to me. I'm going to tell you what he told me because I think it's important for all of us to hear. I said, God, you've got to take this feeling from me. What is this? And he said, no, feel this. And I said, I don't, I don't want to feel this. He said, feel it. Do you understand what this is? I said, no. He said, you're at the end of your strength. I need you, son, to understand that you're not the hero of this story. I am. That's why they call me Savior. And I stopped in my car and leaned my seat back because I was blown away. I am raised to be the lead brother. I am raised to take the criticism and the applause. I am raised to go in first. I am raised to, to have my sisters behind me and I lead the way. I am raised to defend and protect. I have been raised to be 
the hero. And here is God telling me, not only are you not the hero of this story, son, you've never been the hero. It's always been me. And I need you right now in this moment to understand that or we cannot move forward. I'm the hero. And he knows how to talk to me because what he told me was a direct challenge. That's why they call me Savior. That was telling me, what, what's your name again? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm Eddie. Yeah, no Savior in that? No, okay. Just making sure you understand who you are and understand who I am. They call me Savior. I fight this battle. Okay, God. All right. Three minutes later, I took a deep breath. I was back on the road. Haven't had to have that conversation again. But he needed to make sure that I understood. So he let me go through that. He let me feel what I've never felt before. So I can understand. Here he is again taking his disciples across the lake. I love the fact that in the other Gospels it tells you They've been about, they're about, they're about three hours away from shore, so they're in the middle of it. They're in the thick of it. And, 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 Jesus never took his eyes off of him praying from the mountain. You understand how fulfilling that is because the devil will tell you constantly over and over again that you are alone. I have people tell me that they feel like their prayers aren't reaching God. I have people that tell me that, that they don't feel worthy, that they don't feel good enough. It is so comforting to know that Jesus never took his eyes off the disciples in the storm that he sent them in. And he waited until they were at the end of their road. And then he goes for a walk. And I often wonder in my imagination how that walk was because, you know, I have to see it. Was it a stroll? Was it leisurely? Did he have his hands behind his back pondering the cosmos? What was the walk like? Because, you know, a man's walk kind of gives away his authority. You know what I mean? We, 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 we do judge a man by the way he moves. We see a man moving and we go, oh, he's, he, that's not the guy. But you see a man power walking through something, oh, there's the guy. You see a man with his hands behind his back, observing everything, walking calmly, taking it in. Oh, there's a man who thinks before he acts. I wonder how the stroll was, as, as the youth say, how his swagger was. I wonder what it was like. Because the disciples were in the thick of it, rowing. They couldn't get through it. And here comes Jesus walking on the water. Now, let's be very clear so we understand there's a storm that Jesus sent them into. There are storms that happen in our lives. I want to make sure we get the symbolism, so I'm going to speak plainly. There are storms that happen in our lives. Storms that are designed to take us out. Some storms just beat you up. Some storms are designed to sink your boat. Some storms that are designed to completely destroy and devastate whatever is in their path. <laughs> this was a storm that 12 men couldn't row through. This was a storm that all the disciples with all of their combined strength couldn't get through. This was a storm that they were stuck in. This was a storm that was going to topple their boat and they were struggling. And I find Jesus, my Jesus, your Jesus, my Savior, your Savior, walking on top of the very thing that's designed to take you out. Oh, I get excited when I hear that. I do. Because you're telling me, God, that my life that's in turmoil, my life that's in jeopardy, this storm that's come bearing down on me, you are walking on top of, strolling across the ocean, as if this is nothing, my child. Why are you fretting? This is nothing. I have control over even this. But God, you see my boat, it's going down. But God, I'm sinking. I'm bailing water as fast as I can. I'm rowing as fast as I can. Yes, and you're still focused on your strength. Not mine. So let me show you who I am. And I'm going to come and walk on top of your storm. Which freaks me out. 
And it freaks me out because there was only one disciple who was bold enough to say, Jesus, is that you? Then bid me come walk on that storm with you. Oh boy. It didn't say the storm stopped. It didn't say the storm died down a little bit. I'm sure Peter had to shout so he could be heard. But it did say that he got out of the boat and walked on top of the very thing designed to take him out with Jesus Christ. So I, be, I, I began to wonder, well, 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 why didn't the other disciples ask? And, and, and how come Peter got to go? Because it's very simple. You have not because you ask not. How small is your faith, child, that you won't even ask me to help you through the storm? See, there's another story in the Bible that I love because I never, when I read it as an adult, I never understood I could ask for that. Jesus was on the shore and he was battling with some demons. And the demons asked him not to be cast out of the country. 90% of the time, we just want the evil to get out of our house, get out of our business, get out of my pocketbook, get out of my, my finances, get out of my, my, my family. I had no concept until I read the story as an adult that I could ask Jesus to send it out of the country. Let him go bother some sea lion somewhere. Leave us alone. Get out of here. Go to Antarctica, man. Get out of here. I don't want to see you anymore. Don't leave today and come back tomorrow. You are re resonated to Alaska. Bye. Be gone. Go in some mooses. I don't know. Leave me alone. I have no concept that I could ask for such a thing. You have not because you ask. Seek and you will find. Ask. And it will be given to you. Peter's the only one that asks. Do you think Jesus is not powerful enough if all the other disciples are asked to walk on water that he'd have them walk to? But Peter's the only one that asks. So now this is the part of the story where most people focus on why, why Peter sank. Yeah, Peter got walking on water, but he sank. He lost focus and he sank. He took his eyes off Jesus and he sank. He did. And so do you. So do we. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes the storms that we face are so big and so powerful and so massive that in our pain and in our sorrow and in our hurt, we stay focused on Jesus. But as soon as we get a little bit of clarity, as soon as we get a little bit of peace, as soon as we get a little bit of safety, we take our eyes off and we look back at that storm because it's still roaring. It's still there. Soon as we get out of our emotions, soon as we get out of our feelings, soon as we take a deep breath, we take our eyes off of him. And we begin to sink again. The ups and downs of the spiritual life. We begin to sink because we take our eyes off of him and start focusing on the storm. God, I got no money. Focus on me. Well, God, what do I do next? Focus on me. But God, my family's focused on me. Who's the hero of this story? Is it you or is it me? I will tell you what to do next. I will guide your steps. I will focus on, I'll direct your path. But you have to follow me. And you have to stay focused on me. Because bottom line, you're not the hero of any story. There are no great tales about Eddie Turner being a hero. There are no great books written. There's no poetry written. But there are a millennium of information on him. And every single time where it looked like he was boxed in, oh, I'm sure that Friday when he died, I'm sure the devil threw a celebration. I'm sure the whole world seemed like the light of the world had been snuffed out. I'm sure the devil was just waiting on God to concede defeat. Not knowing he had already signed his own death certificate. He signed it. 
himself. Three days later, Sunday, God played his final move. But here's the thing about that one chess move. That move was played in Genesis. We just saw it finally play out. What did he say in Genesis? The woman's going to bear a child, and you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. That chess move was already played in Genesis. We just saw it finally play out. That's the God that we serve, and yet we give in to the storms of our life, and we give in to fear. We give in to the pain. We give in to the sorrow. These things are going to come. But give in to them? No. Yes, I might be afraid for a moment. Until I remember who my God is. There's a reason that the Jews were to tell the story of what God did over and over. Morning, noon, and night. Tell the story. Why? Because life is going to throw you curveballs, fastballs, sliders, trying to use all my baseball analogies now. What else do I know? What are the oh, corkscrews, right? They're going to throw you everything it can at you. You need to remember the promises your father has given you. You need to remember what he has done. So when life tries to hit you with a bean ball, you can remember that God said, stand up and I will stand you up. You need to remember that you have all the armor of God and it can withstand anything. You need to remember that he has never failed you Yet. And I don't mean yet as in he will. I mean think of everything that he's done. He has not failed you. He hasn't. The fact that you woke up this morning. The fact that you made it here today. You know how many accidents that have been out there. The fact that you weren't in Safeway when it burned down. You know what can befall us and how quickly it can happen. But God hasn't failed us yet. So Peter gets out. He walks to Jesus. He takes his eyes off of Jesus. He begins to sink. He begins to hear the storm. He begins to see the waves. He hears the thunder. He sees the lightning. And he begins to fear. And he begins to sink. And he cries out. Oh, some words that we need to remember. And it takes some deep deep things to help us to cry these things out because we are so arrogant. We are so stubborn. And we are so hard-headed that we don't realize the predicament that we're in. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And the Bible says the next, the next two words in it are two of my favorite. And immediately. Oh, I love and immediately. Because that means there's no space between. By the time the syllable came out, Jesus reaches his hand and pulls Peter up. And they walk back to the boat on the water together. And Jesus gets in the boat. And then the storm says, oh, crap. And it dies down. <laughs> Jesus is in their boat. I can't do nothing when Jesus is in their boat. Don't you see that, people? I, the storm can't do anything when Jesus is in your boat. So stop kicking him out the boat. Stop switching boats mid-trip. Stop sending out the life raft and trying to be by yourself in your feelings. Stay in the boat where Jesus is. Because the storm can't bother you when, you're in, when he's in the boat. The storm died down. And they go across the shore. And the Bible says, when this happened... The disciples' eyes were open, and they believed. They didn't believe because he fed the 5,000 plus. They didn't believe because he told the storm, peace be still. But this time, they believed. And they're the ones who, when they went to the other side, ran out telling everybody that Jesus was here. And everybody started coming to Jesus to be healed. Because they believed. What would happen if I was in a church full of believers? And everybody would come here on Sabbath, get rejuvenated, get restored, get ready for the coming week, and then go run out and tell everybody, I know where Jesus can be found. And this place filled up 
we had to have a first, second, and third service. We had to open up on Sundays and have Sunday service. We had to have Wednesday filled up. We got to move it to Tuesday night. And then we got to have another service on Friday night. We got to move the choir to the gym because this place is packed. What would happen? Wait, wait. What would happen if that actually happened? If we actually got out there and told people what we actually believed? Because we allowed Jesus to take us through the storm. We allowed him to get in the boat. I was... I was sent another thing by my friend this week that was powerful. I sent it to Didi. It was powerful. I sent it to my sister. And I'll let you I'll end it with this. Goliath is one of probably the most famous giants in the Bible. Big bad Goliath. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. Goliath legend was huge. Big man, big weapons. Put fear in entire armies. There were bigger giants in the Bible. But they didn't compare to Goliath. His legend was legendary redundancy. Everybody knows how much his weapons weighed. Everybody knows how, how strong he was. The only person who didn't know that was David. And you know why David didn't know about Goliath's massive strength and his power because he was too focused on God's. He never got to experience all that Goliath had, all of his might and ability, all of his muscles and power because he was too focused on God. Compared to God, you're nothing. You're less than nothing. I'm staying focused on him because you're not the problem. He's going to fix that. So I'm going to stay focused on him. David never experienced Goliath's might. The entire Israeli army was afraid. David walked in and said, Him? Do you not understand what my God has done? I have faced bears. I have faced wolves. I have faced lions. One of those is not supposed to be in there, but we're going to go with it. I have been tending my father's sheep, and he has allowed me to conquer them all. This is nothing but one of them. I'll take him down just the same because of him. I'm not worried about how strong he is because I know how strong he is. Why aren't we the same? That's coming from a 13-year-old boy. 12 maybe? 13? And yet we as adults face our giants and go, oh. <sighs> Somebody pray for me. I, don't, I just don't know what to do. Are you kidding me? You know who I serve? Do you understand who I serve? But sometimes he's got to take you through the storm so you, so you know. Sometimes the storm is so that you know who you serve. I constantly pray, God, you believe in me more than I believe in myself. Help me to see what you see. Because I don't see it. Help me to believe like you do because I don't see it. And he constantly tells me, Son, you won't be able to see that until you see me. I need you to fully embrace me. When you fully embrace me, you will know who you are. And that's my storm. I am fully embracing my Father so that I can see with kingdom eyes. Folks, I bring this story to you today to remind you who your father is. This place out here will drive you nuts. The enemy will drive you bananas with all that he throws at you. Life could be burning down around you. You need to hold on to the concept. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am the one, as my favorite song says, the last line of my favorite song, he is the one who never leaves the one behind. And baby, I'm the one that's behind. And he said, I'm not, I'll leave the 99 to go get my boy. I will never leave you behind. I'm a better father than you. And I am God. Trust 
fully in me. By your hands and close your eyes, please. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this conversation that you've given us. We thank you for the reminder of who you are. Your might, your power, your blessings. Father, your love for us. We have no concept, Father. We are sometimes worse than children. Children will at least believe what you say and run with it. We sometimes, Lord, kick up our heels. We drag our feet. We, we struggle, God. So, Father, I'm going to pray this prayer that I prayed for myself, and I'm going to pray this prayer for the whole church. Lord, we believe. Help thou our unbelief. Bless your children today, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.